You have to bear with me this evening. I'm a little bit under the weather. So as the, uh, the song, you know, stand up for Jesus, we're going to stand in his strength alone tonight. And uh, hopefully we'll get through this. But um, Galatians, Galatians chapter 2, great book of the Bible, great book to just clear up salvation on, on many areas, especially when it comes to, you know, being by grace versus through the law. Uh, we're going to dig right in here in, in chapter number two. Is I thought it was real interesting, a lot of the topics that came up. Just as a preface, you know, we're going to look at some of the same scriptures we did on Sunday morning when I talk about church planning, where it's, it, there's a lot that goes hand in hand with what we were looking at um, from the book of Acts on Sunday. So let's, start, let's get started here in verse number one here, Galatians chapter two. The Bible says, Then fourteen years after... I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. So when he goes back to Jerusalem, he explains here that he's he's communicating the gospel privately to them that were of reputation. So there's still, don't, you know, don't forget, even though this is many years later, there's still a very powerful structure in Judaism within, you know, within, within the Jews, like with, within the Pharisees and, the, you know, and all these other people and what he's saying. And, and he's showing some wisdom here is that he's, with some of the people, he's, show, he's, he's sharing the gospel with them privately. Why? Because if it was to be just really public that he's going and talking to some of these figures, you'd get a lot of people then probably coming against them or, or you know, they might put off some kind of a show that because they're, they're real political or something that they wouldn't listen to Paul. When he does it privately, it gives them a better opportunity to actually get through to them and, you know, and give them the gospel and things like that. And we ought to be wise like that. You say, yeah, but it shouldn't matter. I mean, they should be able to just accept the gospel and just forsake everyone else. And, every, you know, like, yeah, they should. But you know what? If you really want people to get saved, we ought to become all things, all men. We might by all means save some. You know, if, if people have hangups, if they're in positions of authority and of power and they are politicians and they do care a lot about what men say, well, let's, st- let's try to give them the, the gospel privately then. If that's going to be an issue, let's just get them the gospel. You know, in whatever way is going to be most effective for them. Now, another point I want to make about this, and, and we're going to see other references to this. I'm going to highlight them real quick, quickly. And this has come up recently in just, in just events that have been happening with, with other preachers and stuff. But um, I've already preached against dispensationalism and this dispensational doctrine, and they say there's all these different time periods, and some of them, not all of them, but, but the hyper-dispensationalists will say that there was even different gospels being preached. They talk about Jesus preached a different gospel than the Apostle Paul, and then there's another gospel that's going to be preached in, you know, in the end times, that like it's going to be some works-based salvation. You know, all this, there's all kinds of nonsense, and they'll say People in the Old Testament got saved by their works and just things that, and and people who teach this, I'll be be straight about it. I don't believe they're saved. Now, I do think it's possible for a saved person to get deceived by these things because they're a babe in Christ, because they don't know the Bible, they haven't studied, and they've just been kind of tossed to, to and fro with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, by cunning craftiness. But the people who are teaching this stuff, because when you read the scripture, it is so abundantly clear that, you know, just by reading the Bible, that men were never saved by the blood of bulls and goats, that it's never been by works. And we're going to see even in this in this passage that if uh, here, let's, let's just look at that verse real quick. Well, we'll get to it a little later, but basically it says that if, if, if um, salvation is of the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And I don't, I, I don't, I, 
I don't know exactly which verse it is, but it's, um, I believe it's a little bit later on in this passage. But that's why Jesus had to come, is because the law w wouldn't provide salvation. And if people could get saved through the law, then Jesus didn't have to come and die. If it was possible for people to get saved by obeying the law, then we didn't need Christ. So it's evident that salvation has never been of the law. And, but here, here's what they focus on, and, and you have to watch out for things like this. Okay, in verse number 2, in Galatians 2, he says, And communicate unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. And see, they want to focus on, oh, that gospel that he preaches among the Gentiles. And then, look at verse number 7. It says, but contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, they want to pull phrases like that out and say, see, those are two different gospels because he's referring to them in like two different names. There's a gospel of the circumcision. There's a gospel of the uncircumcision. And um, let's see, I thought there was one more in here. But they like to take phrases like that and say, see, there's different Gospels. And that's why when you read in, in, the, in the Gospels, it says that Jesus preached unto them the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And they'll say, like, see, that, that was a different Gospel. It's like, no. The same thing can have multiple names or references, but it's the same Gospel. It's the same good news. Like in Revelation 14, it says the everlasting Gospel. And that's why... In Galatians 1, we covered this last week, Paul said, you know, if any man bring any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. So he's very careful to say there is no other gospels. Now, why would he say that? I mean, think about this. The, the, is the gospel that Paul was preaching greater or better than the, the, the gospel that Jesus Christ himself, like our Savior is preaching a gospel, and we're going to say that, that, oh, no, forget what Jesus said. Don't worry about that gospel. That, that, that was only the gospel for the three and a half years that he was on this earth. That's ridiculous. The three and a half years that he was teaching and preaching and doing his ministry. You mean to tell me that that only lasted a dispensation of three and a half years until he rose from the dead? And then we have the gospel according to Paul. I'm sorry, but Paul was not crucified for me. And, and I wasn't baptized in the name of Paul. That's not what I follow. I mean, this is, the, he's, he's, he was, he says, Paul even says that in Galatians 1, that he was preaching the gospel that was committed unto him by revelation of God, by, by Jesus Christ. It was the gospel of Jesus Christ that he was preaching. And that gospel is the same, and it's the same for everybody. And we're going to see that as we get into this chapter, that there isn't a separate gospel for the, for the Jew or for the Greek that it's all the same gospel that everybody needs to obey in order to get saved. So let's continue here in Galatians 2. Look at verse number 3. The Bible says, But neither Titus, who was with me being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Now, keep your place in Galatians 2 and turn to Acts 15. We're going to see basically the same event recorded in two places. So in Acts 15 and Galatians 2 cover the same things that happened. We get a little bit more information on the details here. Now we're going to get into a little bit, a lot more about circumcision and what it means and what it stands for as we get into the book of Galatians because there's other chapters that cover this more in depth. But um, what's happening here is that there were people who were, now first of all, I just want to point this out too, is that Timothy was also a Gentile and he was compelled to be circumcised. And he did get circumcised, and he shouldn't have, but he did. But Titus now is with Paul, and he's saying he was not compelled to be circumcised. 
It, they, they didn't buckle under that pressure by this point because there were people who were coming in. And it says here, false brethren, unawares brought in. I mean, that, that sounds a lot like 2 Peter 2 and Jude when it talks about these false prophets that they, they creep in unawares. They, um, they come in privily or privately and, and their spots in your, in your feast, you know, they're, 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 they basically bring in, he says here, to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. They want to corrupt the church and the, the teaching of salvation by grace through faith alone and add their element of works to it. And their element of works was circumcision. So they take this long-held tradition, this long-held thing of circumcision, which was given unto Abraham, right, which has its, it had its place, and had a purpose, and like I said, we'll get into that a little bit later, but they try to add this and say, well, no, 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 see, you have to believe in Jesus, yeah, but you also have to be circumcised. And anytime you have anybody trying to add anything to putting your faith in Christ for your salvation, watch out for them because they're teaching a false gospel. I don't care if it's, I mean, these days, it's not necessarily circumcision. I don't really hear anything about that being added, but what's a big one? Baptism. Oh no, you have to be baptized to be saved. You can't, you can't just believe, you believe, but you also have to be baptized. That's real popular among Pentecostal circles. No, no, baptism is necessary. You're adding works to, to the grace of God. And it's, and it's totally untrue. Um, and no matter what the, the effort, whether it's you know, turning from your sins or whether it's you know, going to church or going to this church, being a member of a specific church, you know, like that's all nonsense. Salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone, plus nothing minus nothing. And it says here, before we get started in Acts 15, he says, to whom we gave, pl gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. He said, we didn't even, you know, like, there is no reason because it's, it's so settled and established on their salvation doctrine we don't give place to people trying to convince you it's of works. He said, we didn't give place by subject. He said, no, not for an hour. We didn't even give him an hour of our time that the truth of the gospel might continue with you, saying that they're, they're wrong and they just shut them down because they're wrong and they don't need to have anything else about it. But what happened was is that there were people who, and this happened in Antioch, that were confused about this issue because these false brethren crept in and they were starting to teach this works-based salvation and add circumcision and everything else. So we're going to read about that a little bit more in Acts chapter 15. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. See that right there? It's very clear. They're saying, You cannot be saved unless you're circumcised. Is that the gospel? No. Oh, but that's the gospel unto the Jews. No. That's not the gospel at all. Verse 2. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. It wasn't a small dissension. It wasn't just, oh, we're going to agree to disagree on this. He said, no, you're wrong, and they were solid on it and firm on it, and they were loud and vocal about it. There was no small dissension, no small disputation. They disputed them fervently and, and, and told them they're wrong. But the people at, at, at Antioch, they still wanted to, they're like, well, let's go to Jerusalem. And it's like they wanted to have more confirmation from the apostles, from other, from other apostles, from other people, from other men about this question, when really it ought to have been very clear anyways. And that's why Apostle Paul was just like, look, we don't need other men. We don't need anyone else. Like the word of God is clear. Salvation's by faith. You know, like he, as far as he was concerned, there was no need to consult with anybody else. Because the gospel is plain, it's clear. He heard it straight from Jesus. He, you know, he, he knew it was the truth. But he, does, he goes anyways, Paul and Barnabas, and then some other, some other people go with him. Verse number three says in Acts 15, And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the, con the conversion of the Gentiles, 
and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now, what I believe this is referring to here in verse 5, it says there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed. So that these are believers. I don't think they're adding this as a part of salvation. I think what they're doing here is that they're saying, well, we should st they should still get circumcised and keep the law of Moses. As in, like, they should still do these things, even though maybe that's not necessarily, they're saying that that's essential for, for salvation, but that they ought to do these things. And then it says in verse 6, And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, this is a story referring to when Peter went and talked to Cornelius, and he went, you know, they were, they were Italians, they were Gentiles, and he preached the gospel unto them, which is the same gospel, by the way, that he was preaching to the Jews. But when God gave him the revelation in a dream, when he had all the, the, the animals come down from heaven, right, in a sheet, and he said, you know, take Peter, slay and eat. And he says, not so, Lord, I, you know, I've never eaten anything that which is unclean. You know, I've never, I've never done that. And the Bible says, what, what, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou unclean. And he had this vision, and then he got the understanding that He's, he was referring to the, the, the Gentiles and other people saying, look, God has cleansed them. It's, it's fine to go unto them. Don't call them unclean. They're not like these unclean beasts. You can go and, and, and preach the gospel to them. And that's what Peter did. And as Peter was preaching the gospel to these people, they were able to, as they believed, they got the Holy Ghost upon them and they were able to speak with other tongues, which was, was just total evidence to Peter and everyone else that, hey, if God's giving this same gift to them that he gave to us, then God is showing that there is no difference between us, that they can believe just like we can and they can receive the same gifts of God that we could receive of God. And this is what he's explaining to them here. Now, as this comes up and as they're talking about differences between, you know, Jews and Gentiles and everything else. And he's saying, look, God has already established this by his word and by his power and by signs showing that there's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile, that we're both the same. And he's absolutely right in preaching this. And he says here in verse number um, 11. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? What is that yoke? The yoke of obeying the law of Moses. The yoke of being saved by works, by the law. He's saying, look, our fathers weren't able to do it. We weren't able to do it. Now, why do you think they're going to be able to do it? We're not going to put this yoke on them of obeying the law because, look, if you're, if you're going to obey, if you're going to trust the law for your salvation, it's got to be all or nothing. You can't just pick and choose parts of the law and say, well, that's all that's required for salvation. No. If you offend in one point, you're guilty of all. So he's saying, let's not put this yoke on them. That's a burden. That's bondage. They need to be freed from that, just like we needed to be free from that. Verse 11, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. And again, showing there is no difference in the gospel to the Jew or to the Gentile. And these events that were happening, they didn't change the gospel. They, Peter was with Christ and preaching the gospel with Christ. Do you mean to tell me you think that Peter changed the gospel he was preaching after Christ rose again from the dead. 
Because these dispensationalists, they, they, they butcher up the Bible. They, they, they say, oh, we're rightly dividing the word of truth. No, you're, you're making mincemeat of the word of truth because you're just cutting it up into random sections, just, just cutting, 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 and, and coming up with stuff that doesn't even make any sense, that doesn't fit in Scripture at all. And that's why I say if, if you're that, if you're a teacher of this stuff and you can't see this, your eyes are blinded to the truth. You don't know the truth at all. To come up with this garbage of saying, oh, the Apostle Paul had a different gospel. It's the same gospel that Peter was preaching, as is evidenced here in Acts 15. And it's the same gospel that was to the Jew and to the Greek. And it's the same gospel that Jesus, there's no, you have no way of showing that Peter would started preaching a different gospel after, than the one that he was already preaching with Jesus Christ. Why would he change all of the information that he learned from Jesus Christ in preaching the gospel and then just be like, no, you know what? Jesus didn't tell me to preach a different gospel after he was gone. Jesus, but I'm just going to do it anyways. Where in the world would you think that that would be proper doctrine? That they just changed the gospel? It makes no sense, my friends. Go back to Galatians chapter 2. Now, as I already mentioned, the Apostle Paul didn't think it was ever necessary to go to Jerusalem and, and consult with anybody over this issue. And you know what? You ought not to either, especially when it comes to salvation. You shouldn't have to be like, oh, let's go see what the pastor says about this. You know, when, when someone's just confronting you with some total works-based salvation. You ought to have this settled for yourself. And if anyone wants to come to you and be like, oh, we need to go and ask the pastor about this. It's like, we don't need to ask the pastor about this. We don't need to ask anybody else about this. And we see this in, in, in multiple places here in Galatians chapter 2, where the Apostle Paul is kind of bringing this up. And, and honestly, whether it's about salvation or not, when we have the Word of God as our authority... That's what we need to be relying on. And that we ultimately don't need anybody else's opinion on whether or not something's true when we have the Word of God. And I, I, it's just almost interesting anyways. It's almost just like a, a lack of respect for Paul anyways because this is 14 years after he's been in the ministry. At least. Because verse 1 said, Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem. He's been preaching the gospel, getting people saved, doing all kinds of great work. And then people are like, Well, I still think we should go and ask Peter and James and John about this. It's like, he saw Jesus Christ in the way. He, I mean, his conversion was real. He had a lot of evidence for it anyways because he went from you know persecuting the church of God to promoting the church of God. And, you know, there, there is so much there that, that no one should ever doubt his salvation just because of the difference in his, you know, I mean, not everyone's going to have such a demonstrable difference when they get saved, but the Apostle Paul did. And that's a strong, solid testimony to have that, that he went from, from persecuting Christians to becoming a Christian and promoting it. So, um, you know, he, he had a lot to, for people to, to look up to. And, and he was, he was well-versed and well-read in Scripture. He knew, he knew the Bible. So in verse number 6, we'll continue on here. It says, but of these who seem to be somewhat, so these who seem to be somewhat, meaning in reputation, people who seem to be, you know, to, to be looked on as, as um, you know, authorities, he says, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. He's saying, it doesn't, you know, whatever they were, whoever these people are, it doesn't really matter because God isn't just a respecter of persons because it's his word that matters and teaching of his word, not who they are. You don't have to go to a particular pope to find out what the answer is. 
God doesn't accept any man's prayer. He says, for they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. I already knew this stuff. They're not adding anything to my knowledge or my understanding. He says, these, these people that you want to look to as authorities added nothing to me. I already knew all this stuff. Verse number seven, but contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed to me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, right? He's just saying these are the people who seem to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. Now, he's bringing this up, I believe, just so that these people don't get too lifted up. Now, obviously, we ought to respect people and give, give honor unto those that, that, are, that are working and especially those that, are, that you know, they, that elders that, that, um, that are working and striving ought to be considered worthy of double honor. And of course, you know, James, Cephas, John, they, they ought to be, you know, worthy of double honor. But we still ought to be careful. They're, they're still men. They're still brothers in Christ. And he's explaining here, you know, when, when, when they saw that, hey, the same way that God is effectually using them to reach the Jews, to reach the circumcision, God's blessing Paul the same way to reach the uncircumcision, to reach the Gentiles. So they said, well, they offered him the right hand of fellowship and, and he was welcomed right in among them, you know, as a brother and, and, and a fellow laborer with Jesus Christ. And, you know, he, he's, he's right along with them. And he's an apostle also. Let's not forget that. It's not like, you know, they were sending him to go check with the other apostles. It's like, well, he was an apostle too. He's the last apostle, but, but you don't, he shouldn't need to have to, to, to check in with the other ones, uh, especially on something so simple and straightforward as this. But uh, let's keep going here. Verse number 10. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Now, even though they're all apostles, it doesn't mean that they're all perfect. And even Peter was in error. And um, we need to be careful about this type of a mentality or an attitude where we, if you put too much stock in one person as opposed to just being devoted to the Word of God, it can lead you down a bad path. You know, there's, there's a lot of people who um, might be very charismatic, might be able to teach very well, might be able to, to, to preach very well and, and to um, stir you up and, and to get you motivated to do things, and that's great, and praise God for that. But anybody can be in error and we need to just, I mean, no matter who your favorite person is or pastor or teacher or whoever, we always need to be more devoted to God and his word than to a man. And if someone needs to be corrected, as Peter did, then we can't let friendships or even positions of authority come in the way of them being corrected. And that's why the Apostle Paul said he withstood him to the face. He said, I, I you know, I, I didn't, he didn't let it go because what Peter was doing was an error. Now, um, let's keep reading here because we're going we're gonna to get into that as well. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to give us more information here about what exactly he did that was wrong. Verse number 12, For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. So this is kind of interesting too. You see, every disciple and every apostle has their own flaws and has their own areas where they were, they were not right with God. 
And we, we're going to see a little bit later here, even the Apostle Paul, almost the same exact thing that he's confronting Peter about now, rightfully so, he ends up getting himself in a very similar situation where he's wrong. So I'm going to get into that in a little bit, but I just want to point out real quick here. It says that certain came from James. James seems to be a little tied too closely with like the law and the ways of Judaism and had a harder break from a lot of that stuff. And we could see multiple times, just like in uh, when, they, when they went to counsel about what to do in Acts, and we didn't read that part of the scripture, but um, James was one of the ones saying, well, we need to tell them to abstain from meats, you know, and, and drinking of blood and from fornication and from these other things. And it's like, they went down there asking about salvation and then he leaves them with like this other stuff, which is almost, it's just like a little bit confusing. Like, well, yeah, of course you shouldn't do those things, but then there's a lot of other things you shouldn't do also. And we came asking about salvation and you say, yeah, we don't have to be circumcised to be saved, but then we need to do these other things. And it's almost as a little bit confusing. Like, well, do I need to do those things to be saved? You know, and, and what about these other sins then? You know, it's what, it's not very clear. And it's just, it almost seems like just trying to add some more um, of the law upon them, but not clearly as far as, hey, yeah, we shouldn't sin, but none, none of those things is going to affect your salvation. So here we have certain men that came from James, and he says, before that they came, Peter ate with the Gentiles. It wasn't a big deal. He didn't make a difference between him and the Gentiles because the Jews up to that point, and, and you read through the book of Acts, you can see this. I preached through the book of Acts already. Um, a whole, the whole series through the book of Acts is the first series I went through in this church. And you see over and over again that the Jews thought of themselves as better than the Gentiles. They looked down at basically every other group of people than themselves. They thought they were God's special people, God's chosen people, and they looked down upon everyone else. And they wouldn't even eat with them. There's a lot of things that they distanced and separated themselves from the Gentiles in. And that was wrong. They shouldn't have been like that. God's not a racist. God doesn't just have some, you know, his chosen people that were sons of Abraham or sons of Israel that's, well, just because you were born into that line that you're better than everyone else, that's not the way that God treated them at all. But this is the mentality that they seem to have, have gotten. So Peter was eating with the Gentiles because he already received this truth and this information. That they're no different. And we just read that too. Peter said in, in Acts 15, he's like, hey, they're no different than us. They need to be saved just like we need to be saved. You know, they get the Holy Ghost just like we get the Holy Ghost. Everything is the same, so there should be no difference there. And he was, he was acting accordingly in his life and eating with them and showing that he believed that. But now when these other guys come from the circumcision, these, these, these high authority Jews came from James. It says, when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. He feared. And you got to watch out for fear because when you fear, you're going to make the wrong choices. He should have been bold and, and said, no, I know this is right. But instead, he feared and went along with them instead of standing up for what's right. And it says, and as a result of Peter doing that, since he was already a figure that, that people followed, he was a leader. Verse 13 says, And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Barnabas knew, I mean, he was going with Paul all those years. He knew the truth on this subject, just as Peter did. But when Peter went and, and succumbed to the, to the Jews coming in, and not wanting to eat with the Jew, with the Gentiles, him making that that choice, a lot of other people followed him. Oh well, if Peter's doing it, then maybe we should too. And this is the way people are, and that's why you have to be really careful because other people are going to be looking at your actions. 
And when you get into sin and when you do things that are wrong, it doesn't just affect you. And what Peter did here, he drew a whole bunch of people now into doing that which is wrong. And now you're going to have the Gentiles going, what in the world's going on? I thought there was no difference. I thought that we, you know, they're going to be questioning what they're teaching. They're going to be questioning the truthfulness of what's coming out of their lips. And then you also have these, you know, the Jews going, well, it, it didn't help the Jews that came down from James when they were able to get them to, to come with them as opposed to making a stand and be like, no, you guys are wrong. You know, it would have done the people from James a lot better to see, actually, we are going to eat with them and you should eat with them too because you're wrong. It emboldened them to keep up their, their Judaizing position of keeping a separation between the two and embolden them to do that which is wrong and it emboldened everyone else to do that which is wrong by making that, that choice. Verse 14 says, But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, and, and this, is <coughs> this is very commendable of Paul because he had even, I mean, everybody is kind of drawn away into doing that which is wrong, but the apostle Paul he didn't care about what men thought. He cared about what was right, and he saw a problem. He said, you know what? This needs to be corrected, and I don't care if everybody is doing what's wrong. I'm going to stand up for what's right, and I'm going to go to Peter's face and tell him that he's wrong about this. And that's what he did. Verse 14, but when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature, and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for the, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. <clears throat> so he goes up right to his face and he says, look, you're not, you know, he's not doing according to the truth of the gospel. And the truth of the gospel is that there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. And that they don't have to keep this separation. And Peter wasn't demonstrating that when he was caught up with these other Jews. And um, he's saying, look, you're a Jew you live after the manner of the Gentiles and not as do the Jews. Why are you compelling the Gentiles now to live as the Jews do? Why are you trying to bring them into that bondage? You're saying you don't, you don't live like that. And you're trying to show them that this is the way that you ought to be. No, it's no, completely wrong. Now, this is also another proof that it's the same gospel to the Jews as to the Gentiles. Even though they were given different names in this passage, right? The, 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 the gospel under the circumcision and the gospel under the uncircumcision. You see, they could have different names but still be the same gospel. But besides that, it's interesting that Peter got caught up in this. And it shows the power that other people can have over you. And especially when you, you're fearful of them. Uh, Peter's the one that rightfully said that God put no difference between the Jew and the Gentile in Acts 15. He was right on that. And even though he knew that, he was still intimidated by some of these Judaizers that, that, that had some kind of clout or whatever from Jerusalem that came from James, and he was intimidated by them. And, you know, especially for leaders, Peter was a leader, and there's other leaders and this, like, I'll just say this to, to either future pastors sitting in here today or, or anyone on the internet that might ever catch this as a pastor, you know, you ought not to be fearful of what some other leader is going to think of you or say about you. And don't, don't hide yourself. Don't um, hide what you believe. And don't back down on things that you know to be true because that's wicked and that's sinful for you to care more about what men think than to care about what God thinks about you because 
We are all called to preach. Anyone who's a pastor needs to preach and to teach the whole counsel of God and needs to be acceptable in the sight of God and God only. You're not here to preach to, to the approval of the people in the church. You're not to preach to the approval of other pastors or other people that you're friends with or other big name leaders. You are not to preach for any of those people, for any of those reasons. What you're supposed to be preaching for is to be acceptable in God's eyes and to preach his words and to preach his truth. And whatever you see to be true and faithful in the Bible, you need to preach that and don't fear what anyone else is going to think because it doesn't matter. If they break fellowship with you, if they stop being your friends, I'd rather be right with God than right with man that's wrong about a doctrine in the Bible. You need to grow a spine. You need to have boldness. Like the Apostle Paul had boldness. Even when everyone else was caught up in this dissimulation with Peter, the Apostle Paul said, no, this ain't right. You guys are doing what's wrong. And I don't care what James thinks. I don't care what Peter thinks. I don't care what anybody thinks. The Bible's clear. God's word is clear. And that there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. And this is what we saw happen here. And that's what's right. This is the right example. And people need to be following this more. And if there, you know, there's preachers out there that, that may in the closet be believing in things like the post-trib rapture or they might have finally come to the conclusion that Israel is not a nation that's supposed to be blessed by Christians that they're not just God's chosen people that that no matter what they do they can do no wrong and we just need to bless them and, and support them but they're afraid to come out and preach it they need to come out and preach it because if, if that's their belief then they are in sin by not preaching what God has led them to believe and that God has laid on their heart to believe that they need to preach it no matter what. And don't be worried about, about other, any ramifications of what you preach. See, any preacher that's afraid of what might happen by preaching the word of God, in my opinion, is not qualified to preach the word of God because we are not to be fearful for any reason, whether it be from friends, whether it be from other leaders, whether it be from people of open, whether it be from the government, whether it be because preaching something is illegal. We, God does not want a preacher that's afraid to be preaching his word. We can't be fearful. We have to just preach what he has instructed us to preach, and that's the bottom line. Let's keep reading here. In, in, um, actually, turn, if you would, to, to Acts chapter 21. Because I want to point this out too. Now, Paul had great boldness and did exactly what was right in this situation. No doubt about that. But I want to point out one area where, where the Apostle Paul himself was wrong. And this is mostly, the reason I'm pointing this out is one, None of the apostles or disciples were perfect. They all had their flaws, and we see that in Scripture. God, I think, is careful to, to show us the, the error and problems with, with every man. No matter how great they were, no matter you know, how, how, um, how devoted they were and, and how much great works they did, they were still all just men, and we shouldn't idolize any of them. But... Um, also to show the influence that people can have over you. Because even the Apostle Paul, when he was, while he was strong in this situation, we're going to see another instance where he was not so strong, where he also succumbed to the pressure that's being put on him from other people to do something that he already knew was wrong and he shouldn't have done. Acts chapter 21, we're going to start reading in verse number 17. This is much later in his life from this standpoint. Verse number 17 reads, And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James. And see, look, there's James again. His name is being referenced here. 
and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe. And they are all zealous of the law. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. So they're saying, well, you know, we've been hearing that you've been teaching that they ought not to circumcise their children and to walk after the customs. And they're kind of laying it on them like, what is it that you've really been saying, Paul? What, you know, are you teaching this? Is this what you're teaching? And you know what? They don't have to circumcise their children because that's been done away. That, 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 that seal of circumcision, again, we'll go into circumcision in, in the next couple of weeks. But yeah, he's not wrong for teaching that. And depending on what customs they're talking about, he didn't need to do that either. But here's what they say before he even answers. He just, they just say, well, look, they're, they're all going to want to know, all these Jews that believe, they're going to want to know what's going on here because they're getting these reports. So he says in verse 23, Do therefore this that we say to thee, We have four men which have a vow on them. Them take and purify thyself with them and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. So he's saying, well, just so that we could show and prove to everybody that you still are keeping the law, we want you to do all of this, and then they'll know that all these rumors that they're hearing are nothing. Now, here's what's so wicked and wrong about this when you read the next verse. Verse number, well, the, ver the next two verses. Verse number 25 says, as touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled from fornication. Now, this is James and his crew saying that there is a difference between the Gentiles and the Jews because he's saying, well, we've already established that the Gentiles don't have to do these things. That's what he said there. As touching the Gentiles, which believe, we've already concluded that they don't have to do anything but, you know, keep themselves from things offered to idols and blood and strangled and fornication. As if that's all they have to do in the law anyways. It's like, no, they ought to keep the whole law, but not the parts that have been done away. And now what the Apostle Paul involves himself in with this vow and the shaving of heads, look at verse number 26. Then Paul, look, Paul went along with this now. Paul goes along with what he wants him to do. And you know what that includes? Then Paul took the men and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. Now in the New Testament, should they be offering animal sacrifices anymore after Jesus Christ has already come? The lamb slain from the foundation of the world? No, and you know what? The Apostle Paul knew this as well. That's why he taught that you didn't need that anymore. They didn't do the animal sacrifice, but what does he do? By fear of these people that come in and, and trying to show, oh yeah, no, look, I still follow the law. He goes in with them and shaves his head or whatever and, and accomplishes the days of purification. And he's waiting now for an animal sacrifice to be offered for them. And that was wrong. And he should not have done that. Now, as we, I already mentioned, you know, James and his followers are still trying to put a difference between the Jew and the Gentile, and they shouldn't be. They are wrong, and they've been wrong about that all throughout the Bible. We see that they're kind of stuck on that and aren't able to get, get right on that aspect. Why would it be okay for the Gentiles to not observe circumcision, but the Jews still have to? That doesn't make any sense. Why, why would one have to do it and not the other? There's, there's no purpose for that. And um, this issue of circumcision creeping in and corrupting salvation was a big deal uh, 
And as I've already mentioned before, we're going to see that in the weeks to come, what Paul wrote about it and what he actually believed about it under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. See, we see some of these actions like Peter commits a wrong action. Here the Apostle Paul was wrong in doing this. But it's different from what he preached and spake under the guidance of the Holy Spirit in God's Word. So those, when the Apostle Paul is writing and it's under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, that is Scripture. Like that is truth. That is right. Just because we see him contradicting himself in a situation, we know that he was wrong because that situation wasn't of God. And in fact, when the Apostle Paul was going to Jerusalem, at, like, when you read the book of Acts, so many times people are saying, don't go to Jerusalem. And it's, and it's recorded that people, they're, they're, you know, prophets through the Holy Ghost were saying to him, don't go to Jerusalem. That God was literally warning him not to go to Jerusalem. And he's, he keeps hearing it over and over and over again. Yet Paul becomes hard-headed and is not receiving the message literally from God. That it wasn't just that these people were coming up with their own message and not to him to go to Jerusalem. God was telling him not to go. And I think God, knowing all things, knew that he was going to get himself into trouble and do this thing so he didn't want him to go because this is like the only thing that happens and, and then this is what stirs up all this controversy and they arrest him and that's when he ends up having to go to rome and you know when he appeals unto caesar and all this other stuff happens as a result but see i think god wanted him to do other work god had other places for him to go he didn't want him to get caught up in this nonsense in jerusalem and damage his own testimony and, 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 and get caught up into this, this stuff. That's why he was telling them, not, don't go there. Don't go to Jerusalem. Now, of course, thankfully, God is still long-suffering and, and had a plan B for Paul to be able to still serve God and to do all these other things and to serve him at Rome and whatever. But he should have heeded that warning. And he never should have gone in and participated in this event where, where that's already should have been done away. And to, and to still support any type of view that there's this difference between the Jew and the Gentile because there's not supposed to be. And he himself taught that there's not a difference. But we can look at this and, and take heed. Another area to take heed in is the influence of, of other people on your life. And even other church people or other believers. You know, I, I, James was a believer. You know, I'm not doubting that. But he was definitely wrong on this issue. I mean, he was way wrong on, on, on some of these aspects. And yeah, they didn't have to be circumcised. And I'm not saying that James taught that you had to be circumcised to be saved. But he was holding on to a lot more than, than he should have been. That, that these things, you know, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. And we see that in Scripture from the, you know, the Apostle Paul's own writings. That, that, it's, that it, it doesn't matter. And that it wasn't just for the Gentiles that it doesn't matter, but it's for everybody because there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Let's go back, if you would, to Galatians chapter 2. We're almost done. I'm going to wrap it up right now. Let's kind of read the rest of the chapter here and close out. Verse number 17 in Galatians chapter 2, the Bible reads, But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid, for if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. And that's interesting too. He's saying, you know, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? Of course not. You know, even the Apostle Paul he said, he built again the things which I destroyed. I make myself a transgressor. He was destroying the concept that there's a difference between the Jew and the Gentile, yet he was end up building that up again. Yeah, he's the transgressor, but that doesn't make anything less of Christ or of God. I mean, the truth in God's word is still the truth. And, and whether we um, are found sinners that doesn't uh, make Christ the minister of sin. Christ didn't make us do those things. We do that on our own. We're the ones that screw up 
not Christ. What, what Christ does, everything Christ does is good, but we sometimes stray from that. Verse number 19, For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And there's a verse I was looking for. It's the last verse in the chapter. If righteousness come by the law, if anyone was ever saved by the law, as many people like to, to teach and tell you, then <coughs> Christ died in vain. Yep. That's what the scripture says. You are making, by teaching, that people could, were ever could be saved by the law, you are bringing the value of what Christ did down to nothing because he wouldn't have had to do what he did if it were possible for men to be saved by the law. And you have cheapened the grace of God to nothing. And that's pretty serious. No one has ever, you know, we can't frustrate the grace of God. When you frustrate it, one, you're adding works to it. That's you're frustrating it. You're confounding it. You're confusing it. You're, you know, God's grace is God's grace. And, you know, we went over this last week in Romans chapter 4 is a, is a great example. People have always been saved by believing, by calling upon the name of the Lord, not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, there shall no flesh be justified. No flesh. Not Jewish flesh, not Gentile flesh, no flesh. So don't be deceived by other, and I don't care how big the name is. They want to teach you some other gospel. You know what? Let them be accursed. Even just teaching that, oh, well, now we believe in salvation by grace through faith, but in other, you know, you know what? They're still teaching another gospel. I don't care if they're not telling people at the door that that's what they believe, but like, you're still preaching there's other gospels. And, and as far as I'm concerned, they can be accursed. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for strengthening me to preach tonight. Dear Lord, I pray that you would please um, help your words to sink into our hearts and into our minds. Lord, help us not to be forgetful ears. Help us to retain the knowledge that we receive from your word. God, help us to be strong in our own faith. And while it's good to receive great teachings from men, dear Lord, help us never to be so devoted to a man that we would um, forsake your, your words and, and the things that you, you teach us through the Holy Ghost, dear Lord, and that we would have our priorities straight and that we would um, just stand with your words. And if a man contradicts that, then, then we would be able to withstand them to the face, dear Lord, no matter who that is. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.